Good morning again, everyone. It's good to see you. Welcome to worship. I'm Robert Roseberry, pastor here at St. Paul's, and I want to thank you for being here today to worship God with us on this second Sunday after the Epiphany. Good morning. My name is Joyce DeVork, and I will be your liturgist this morning. Here at St. Paul's, we seek to be a Christian community that affirms God's love by transforming lives connecting generations, impacting our community and world, and making disciples for Jesus Christ. Whether you're a part of our online community or whether you're here in person, we hope that you'll feel welcome here. For those of you here in our sanctuary, feel free to log in to Facebook and say hello to everyone on our live stream as we worship. You can also go to spocala.org to fill out a visitor card. If you're new here and would like to chat with someone about Jesus or about joining our church family. Uh, I mentioned Noel Brouillard. She is uh, filling in today at the piano. We're grateful for that. Uh, uh, Joe is out sick. She was uh, She did test positive for COVID this week. She is doing okay, but did test positive and is, uh, is out sick. And uh, Deb is isolating because of exposure, And uh, but she is feeling fine. Uh, but that is precisely why we're all masked today, uh, just because uh, you never know. Uh, and Joe was not aware that she had it, was showing no symptoms. Uh, later on, tested positive. So pray for their health and well-being, and uh, hopefully Joe, will be, Joe and Deb will be back with us soon. So I'd like to also welcome Craig and our children up for our SP Kids sermon at this time. Dear God, thank you for helping us remember this wonderful man who taught 
taught us so many lessons while he was alive, and help us follow in his lead to do things without violence, but promote peace while we make change. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's head down to the fellowship hall and see what Aaron has for us today. Okay? Here you go. Today you're going to notice a theme of names, and so our second centering song is hymn number 154. If you're having your hymnals with you, we're going to sing verses 1, 4, 1, 2, 4, and 6. It's all hail the power of Jesus' name. You're welcome to stand as you're able and sing with us. Let's begin our prayers with the people as we pray together at this time. 
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O Lord, open our hearts to the surprising ways in which you offer to us your love and your presence. Help us claim our names that you have given us. Help us to truly believe in the wondrous ways that you worked in our lives. Give us hearts and spirits for service to you. Help us to really understand the miraculous ways in which you have already worked in our lives and will continue to work as we journey on in faith. Bring to us the light of joy and let it flood throughout our whole beings so that we may be transformed and named as people of joyful service and faith. As we lift up all those whom we know need your abundant life to be present to them in a special way, let us pray at this time for all those who are grieving. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. We pray for all those who are in care facilities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask that you bless the giving of our prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness, knowing that all we have comes from you and is given to your glory, whether we give online or in person. Lord, in your mercy, Lord of light and joy, the daylight hours here are getting longer for us, and evening comes a little later. The dawn gets a little earlier each day, but there is still darkness that persists in our hearts. We continue to look at the miraculous ways that you work in our lives as mere stories or happenstance. From the beginning, though, of all that is, you've poured your love and light into this world and into our lives. You have tried to convince us through countless ways that we have a new name. You've offered us countless blessings and opportunities for service, some of which we've followed and others that we have ignored. You've forgiven us and healed our spirits. And Lord, we continue to bring before you the names and situations of people that are in dire need. We ask for your healing mercies, and yet we wonder sometimes if you really are with or turn our moaning and crying into songs of praise and hope. Give us spirits of trust and rejoicing that we may truly be people, be your people, all of our days. This we ask in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our music offering is hymn number 494. If you have your hymnals with you, Kumbaya, we're going to sing all six verses. Uh, if you know the words, please join in along. If you have your hymnal with you, join along. Uh, but we hope that you'll enjoy this next song and worship with us.
Our scripture reading today is from Isaiah, chapter 62, verses 1 through 5. For Zion's sake, I will keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake, I will sit still until her righteousness shines out like a light, and her salvation blazes like a torch. Nations will see your righteousness, all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name, which the Lord's own mouth will determine. You will be a splendid garland in the Lord's hand, a royal turban in the palm of God's hand. You will no longer be called abandoned, and your land will no longer be called deserted. Instead, you will be called, My delight is in her, and your land married. Because the Lord delights in you, your land will be cared for once again. As a young man marries a young woman, so your sons will marry you. With the joy of the bridegroom because of his bride, so your God will rejoice because of you. The word of God for the people of God. Praise be God. So I was about four years old, and my mother was pregnant with my sister. And we were, I remember sitting around, I think it was in the living room, and the three of us, my mom, my dad, and me, were trying to figure out what we would name this new baby that we were having. And at one point, I think somebody said, well, you know, I mean, it's just a name. I mean, she'll grow to, you know, might be called something else, might be called a shorter version of it. And at the time, I, I took hold of that, and I said, well, if it doesn't really matter, let's just name her Orange. <laughs> Thankfully, my sister, Margaret Amanda Roseberry, is not named Orange. Very thankful for that. But as her older brother, you know, I had other things in the store. But what really is our name to us? There's a reason we don't name our kids Orange. Prospective parents spend countless hours every year trying to decide on just the right name for an expected child. A rose by any other name would smell just as sweet really doesn't ring true when it's your baby. We want just the right moniker. In a crude sense, it's kind of an exercise in branding. We want our kid to have a name that gives them kind of a, a good start on life. When people say their name, we want it to be a name that's respectful. That is something that's kind of, you know, good for them. One of my covenant brothers just baptized a kid named, and I kid you not, Lucas Skywalker. <laughs> and I asked if I could use this, this baptism for a thing. He sent me a picture of the family, and I regret that I don't have it on the screens today. Uh, but... It was, just looks like a normal family sitting there by the baptism font. And there's this little baby, and his name is Lucas Skywalker. I imagine it probably added a little different nuance to the liturgy. And I don't know that I could have kept a straight face either. Um, we all know bad names when we see it. But sometimes they have such a great story that you know it's worth it. Other times you just can't help but feel a little sorry for the kids that have to grow up with a name like that. According to MomJunction.com, here are some of the worst baby names for boys and girls taken from a Reddit forum a few years ago. The first one is Helzel. It's a combination name, which sometimes is a terrible idea. And this name just kind of proves that. The Reddit user stated that the mother liked the name Hazel, but the father was a biker and was a Hells Angel. So they came up with the combo name of Helzel. Another name is Brittany Shakira Beyonce. Why? And that name does belong to one person. The parents were huge fans of those three singers, and they couldn't decide who to name their daughter after. So they named her Brittany Shakira Beyonce. And what's even funnier is that they call her by that whole name every single time they say her name. <laughs> there are 328 people currently in the United States named ABCDE. I kid you not. In the year 2000,
2009 alone, 32 babies were given this alphabetical name. It seems that the parents thought of giving an early head start in learning the alphabet to their child. Literally spelled A, B, C, D, E. A, B, C, D. So if you ever run into anybody with the name A, B, C, D, that's what it is. There's also Clitus. A French couple named their child Clitus. When asked the reason, they said they were huge fans of a U.S. actor with this name. Can you think of who that would be? That was the second question. And they replied in their French accent, Clitus Wood. Come on, Clint Eastwood. Okay, all right. I knew it would go on everybody sitting here later. There's also another name. This apparently um, was from a, a person that was in the Navy, and he came across with a general with the last name Star Cruiser. And when he looked this officer up, he found out that his full name was Mercury Constellation Star Cruiser. It's a great name for a guy that should have been an astronaut. And then there is Mason, which you might think, no, that's not too bad. But a mother named her son Mason because she felt Mason when he was born. <laughs> Poor kid will remain a mystery throughout his life. There's a lot of naming in the Bible, too. The creation account in Genesis chapter 2 has Adam naming all the animals because naming was important. In the scriptures, a person's name is seen as revealing something essential about their character. Jacob was a manipulator who became Israel, or blessed of the Lord. Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, and that name means pleasantness, became known as Mara, or bitterness, because of the death of her husband and sons. Jesus even did a wordplay on Peter's name when he referred to his confession as the rock upon which the church was built. And he took Peter or Petros, which means stone, and then he changed it to Cephas, which is another way of saying the same thing. And he said, I will name you Cephas or rock because you are the rock upon which my church will be built, or your confession is the rock upon which my church is built. Now in our scripture passage today, Isaiah pictures a day when God will give a new name to his people. The, our, our little snippet we took today from that long writing of Isaiah is from what most Bible scholars call third Isaiah. First Isaiah is written in a different time and place. It faces the Assyrian threat in the 8th century before Christ. Then second Isaiah presupposes an Israelite audience that is currently living in exile in Babylon. Then third Isaiah speaks to a population who has recently returned from the exile and is now working to restore the former glory of their homeland. And so much of the, the hopeful language that we read in Isaiah, much of the language that, that we see is so messianic and beautiful and hopeful, that's taken from 2nd and 3rd Isaiah, because that was the time when people were dreaming about returning from their homeland. And Isaiah speaks so powerfully to that desire for home, for a restored home. Now in verse 1 we, we read, For Zion's sake I won't keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake I won't sit still. Until her righteousness shines out like a light. And her salvation blazes like a torch. And there's not really any indication in our scripture passage. But let me just ask, who's talking here? Is it Isaiah? Is it God? The answer is probably yes. And why can't the speaker keep silent? It's not because there's a, an injustice to reveal. It's not because there's anger behind it. The reason that the speaker cannot keep silent is because the righteousness of Jerusalem and Zion hasn't shown out yet. Salvation hasn't blazed in glory. Now this is because at that time the temple had not been completed. The city hadn't yet been fully restored. They had just gotten back home and things were still a little rough. Things were still incomplete. And so literally what Isaiah is telling us here is, you know, for the sake of the city that I love, for the sake of the homeland that I love, for the sake of the temple, Zion, that temple mount there in Jerusalem, I won't keep silent until that, that salvation is there, until the righteousness of, of, my, of my homeland blazes forth in glory. And when this happens, the nations will see it, we're told. The prophet is confident that God's ultimate purpose 
will be realized and that the righteousness of Israel will ultimately be made manifest, will be made real. There will be an epiphany throughout the land as people see the light of God anew. And because of this fundamental change in Israel's character, they will be given a new name. This new name will be indicative of her new identity. We read in verse 3a that you will be a splendid garland in the Lord's hand. Now, most scholars think of the, the golden days of Israel's history being during the reign of David and Solomon. But also at the same time, the seeds of her demise were also sown. Not all of her position, wealth, and strength came as a result of the Lord's blessing. And the Old Testament portrays the relationship between the people and God as that of a bride and her husband. And this particular bride struggles with adultery, whether it's other gods, other influences. The particular struggle in this marriage throughout the Old Testament, you see the metaphor over and over again, is adultery. Now, I'll expand a little bit more on this in our sermon, our, our um, Sunday chat later on, but essentially, Israel and Judah, the two kingdoms, were often portrayed as the unfaithful wife, cheating on God with other gods, worshiping them, and defiling their relationship with Yahweh. But God, through the prophet, sees a day when Israel is restored as a crown of splendor, no longer an unfaithful wife, but a royal diadem, both symbols of royalty and the right to rule. Likewise, the church has been blessed today, and the church is often referred to as the bride of Christ. You see how that metaphor has just kind of continued in the New Testament and in our day today. The New Testament tells us that we will be given a new name also individually, but we will be given the name of Christ as we continue to live with Christ as our Lord and Savior. We're told in Hebrews that we are heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ, and together we are the bride of Christ. That's one of our names as the church. So how does this all affect me, you might be asking. What does this all have to do with me, the naming stuff? I'm fine with my name. I've had it all my life. I kind of take it for granted. Well, spiritually, in a spiritual sense, you've got to know who you are before you can know who God is making you into. There's nothing worse than Christians who, well-meaning or not, don't understand who they were before they began to follow Christ. Because that is the raw material that God is working with. That mess that God picked up and said, picked up and said, you are holy, and we said, I'm going to follow you. That mess that God picked up on that day, that is who we're starting with. And if we don't understand that, don't understand the, the spiritual name of that and can't name it and understand it, then we'll never know what God is working with as we mature in our faith. We'll never realize the gnarly and sinful bits that God is trying to redeem unless we become self-aware about them. So, what are your names? What's the, the name you started out with, and what's the spiritual name that God wants to give you? You read about the naming in Isaiah here, that how you, you once were called this, but now you will be called this. And we might, the, the common English Bible didn't specifically say it because it translated all those different names into English. But here in verse uh, verse 4, the second half of verse 4, instead you will be called my delight is in her and your land Mary. And that word there is Beulah. Most of us know that word. Beulah land is an old hymn that many of us remember saying at some point. And that is, that word Beulah is I think at one point it was a fairly common first name. But that's what that name means, Mary. And this is also why reading the Bible is so important. There are tons of stories about real people just as frail and faulty as you and me. And those people can help us identify with God trying to build our spiritual identity. Maybe we'll see ourselves in James, or in, who is the brother of Jesus, or in Noah, or in Ruth, or in Naomi, or yes, even good old Habakkuk, who, by the way, has a pretty cool story when you read into it. The Bible is a treasure trove of real lives that we can personally identify with. And that's part of the point, anyway. That story, their stories, are our stories, too. 
all the way from Adam to today. And they can form us in the same way if we'll only prayerfully read them. So maybe there's a person that you read in the Bible and you're like, man, that story sounds like me. Or that person has the same issues as I do. Or that person went through something I went through. And man, that's, that really speaks to me. And maybe that's your, the name that you start out with. The name that God is redeeming into the new name. And you, you read another part of the Bible and you say, man, this, this person grew into this kind of a faithful follower. And that's, that's what I want to be. That's where I, I feel God changing me and molding me into as he's growing me spiritually. And that can be the other name. The name that God is growing you into. You've got to know who you are before you can know who God is making you into. So this week, as you start out the new year, you may have made commitments or resolutions or things that you want to do. Maybe you didn't make them too official, so if you mess them up, you won't feel bad. Um, but starting out this new year, do that little thought experiment. Where am I starting out? And where, where do I feel God growing me into? Maybe there's a character in the Bible that you can identify with. Maybe there's a, a character in your personal history that you can really identify with as somebody who, who had these kind of issues and grew into this kind of a person. And you think, man, that's, that's somebody that I really feel God telling me to emulate. Maybe there's a character from history that you can say um, you really want to emulate. Because naming is so important. And that name that we start out with, that imperfect kind of cruddy stuff that God starts out with, that name is a name that is still precious to God. Because that's the stuff that God takes and loves and accepts and redeems into the new name. You don't lose your humanity. It's God redeeming your humanity and making you into reconcil reconciled humanness. A quick, uh, since we are celebrating Martin Luther King, uh, Martin Luther King Day tomorrow, I think it's important that we, as you think about naming and what it means to be associated with a particular name, I want to mention something that he gave his followers that I think might help you as you think about your own name. It was, um, I don't know if it was called then, but it's, uh, it's called now, the Ten Commandments for Nonviolence. This was, if people were going to be associated with his civil rights movement, he asked people to sign on. He said, you've got to, if you're one of us, if you're going to be associated with our name, here is what you need to sign on to. So these were the Ten Commandments he asked all of his folks um, to pledge to follow. And I think they're just really, really wonderful if you're going to be associated with, uh, with the nonviolent movement for civil rights. Number one, meditate daily on the teachings in life of Jesus. Number two, Remember always that the nonviolent movement seeks justice and reconciliation, not victory. Number three, walk and talk in the manner of love, for God is love. Number four, pray daily to be used by God in order that all men might be free. Number six, observe both with friend and foe the ordinary rules of courtesy. Number seven, seek to perform regular service for others and for the world. Number eight, refrain from the violence of fist, tongue, or heart. Number nine, strive to be in good spiritual and bodily health. And number ten, follow the directions of the movement and of the captain in the demonstration. Don't go off and do your thing. All right, but those are, and the captain in Another sense would be Jesus, right? Follow the orders of our captain. Follow the orders of Jesus in our life and in everything. So if you're going to be associated with God and with his movement in the world, this is a great rule to start following. And you can look that up under the Ten Commandments of Nonviolent Protest. Martin Luther King, you can Google that and find this list very easily. Uh, but here on this weekend that is named after him, I thought it was a good way for us to start as we think about what our names are. You join me in prayer. Lord, the Bible says that you have called us by name. And in that name, you have said that you are ours, that you love us, and that you sent your Son to die so that we could be free. Lord, help us to remember that promise. That you take the old us, whatever that name is, and you've loved it enough 
to save it. And through that, you are growing something new, that new creation that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians. You are growing that new creation into something pure and holy and redeemed. You're not saying that the old is worthless. You're actually saying that that is worth starting with. Lord, thank you for redeeming us, for saving us, for giving us a new name through our baptism and through our faith in you. May we always live up to that name. May we grow it, nurture it, and sanctify it with your grace and love. Let's affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered in the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
Uh, second thing, as we're getting ready for our church rummage sale, February 25th and 26th, uh, so please see Amber Gellner, who is right there. Um, if you've got any questions or, or any stuff, uh, we're working on getting arrangements for that and making sure that we have help. Also, um, Amber will need a lot of help of people help with the sale. Uh, she's trying to find some volunteers, so please see her if you can help with you know, helping people out as they're going through things or in collecting money and bringing it back to the same. You know, a lot of stuff is going to need to go on for this. Uh, and the more people we have, the bigger it can be. And we certainly uh, would love to have a big, great guard sale for our community. Number three, in our move toward worship that's live streamed and uh, involved both in an online and in-person congregation, we can still use some extra hands so that all the duties don't fall on the same person each Sunday. Uh, we'd love to set up a rotation schedule for our volunteers. So if you're interested or you know someone who is, please do let us know. Uh, we can use help with live streaming. Uh, that is Ed back there graciously here almost every Sunday live streaming. Uh, they're back there toward the sound booth. Um, and uh, we need someone to help set up on the sound board each Sunday. Uh, Eric Nelson is normally there. Uh, John Curlin is back there uh, in the sound booth today. We certainly uh, help that. John is kind of a floater. He helps with whatever he needs help with. Uh, but that means that if there's ever two people out on a Sunday, we're in trouble. So um, we would love more hands to help with that. Uh, and teaching is available, by the way. Uh, also, in video, uh, Elizabeth is making the slides. Uh, and she graciously agreed to, throughout through the month of January, uh, help with the projection. But after the end of January, uh, we don't have anybody to take over for her in the projection department. So uh, we do, if you can help with that, it's a computer, it's fairly an easy system, uh, please do let us know. Uh, we hope that we can get some help and get more folks involved uh, in being a part of that. So that's all the announcements. Aren't you glad they're over? But thank you. We'd love to help. Um, would you please join me in our closing hymn? It is number 519. Would you stand as you're able and sing with me, lift every voice and sing? This was one of the anthems of the Civil Rights Movement. It's a great song on this Martin Luther King Jr. weekend to go out on as we celebrate uh, and remember the cause uh, that still is worth fighting so hard.
you and give you peace. And may that peace shine within you. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine.